Hello, this is Patricia Martin, your host for Young in the World. Joining us today is Maria Tatar, author of a compelling new book about mythology, Heroine with a Thousand and One Faces. Tatar is the John L. Loeb Professor of Research at Harvard University. She's author of several books on Brothers Grimm and other fairy tales, including The Hard Facts of the Grimm's Fairy Tales, Off With Their Heads, Secrets Beyond the Door, and she's the editor of Classic Fairy Tales, as well as the annotated Brothers Grimm and the annotated Hans Christian Andersen, and Enchanted Hunters, pow The Power of Stories in Childhood. She's also a senior fellow at Harvard University's Society of Fellows. Maria Tatar, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I, I you know, let me just for a second, because we're recording this on video too, hold this beautiful um, book up. I poured over this book. And in fact, it was a, a Jungian who turned me on to this, this uh, fascinating look at the, the hero model. And if I could just like tee this up for a second with some background on why Jungians are so fascinated with myth and, and uh, fairy tales. Many of Carl Jung's theories can be tied back to myths and fairy tales. He used them to help people understand more abstract ideas, ideas like tr the transcendent function. When someone moves from this layer of understanding to, to, to another whole mindset. And he started to see that the people in his practice were telling him about dreams that they had and they were all had a similar hero story to them. And so they stopped being personal and started being about what he then deemed was the collective unconscious and went on to say that the reason so many myths are the same is because it's a projection from the unconscious, the collective unconscious that gives us a way of understanding each other on an unconscious level. So with all these big ideas in mind, I was thrilled to get my hands on your book because it calls for a new way of thinking about the hero. Tell us about that. Yes, well, you can tell from the title of the book that I was referring to or standing on the shoulders of Joseph Campbell, who wrote a, in a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he was writing this book in the 1940s during the Second World War. It came out a few years uh, later. And uh, Campbell didn't really pay much attention to, uh, to heroines, that is, he saw women as the goal of the hero. Well, 70 years later <laughs> comes the global pandemic and I am doing a lot of reading and processing basically a lifetime of reading. And before that, I begin noticing uh, the heroines in stories from ancient times, but also in the stories that we tell today. And what I discovered is that these heroines are not warriors at all. They're not fighters, but they are curious, they are crafty, and they are caring. Those seem to be the features. They were never out on the journey, the hero's journey. They had to stay at home, um, and they engaged in the conspiratorial crafts, the domestic crafts, creating beauty. And also, to me, what is beautiful about the story of the heroine is that the holy grail for them is justice. That's what they're searching for. That's such an important thread. These, uh, because what you're really, I think, putting forward is there's another value system that as we look at the heroine, she brings with her. And one of those that I was fascinated by was this idea of curiosity, this, this attribute of curiosity. Why is in these times, why is it so important for us to highlight heroines for their curiosity? Oh, well, I love that question because curiosity is something that was demonized in past ages. That is, there's so many cautionary tales about uh, curiosity getting you into trouble. 
Eve, for one thing, um, who is uh, tempted by the snake. And because of her curiosity, she brings sin and evil into the world. And then there's the story of Pandora, who famously opens this box and being, brings toil and trouble into the world, leaving us with nothing but hope, which is a good thing, but you'd like to have a little bit more than that. Uh, and then all of these stories in, as soon as children's literature uh, begins, that is when, when we begin putting stories for children between the covers of a book, you have all these tales about uh, curiosity as something that needs to be beaten out of the child, basically. Uh, don't be curious because it's going to get you into trouble. And curiosity is linked with disobedience. Think Eve and Pandora again, this act of disobedience. So uh, I think, you know, somehow to just shift the calculus, to change things, you begin to realize that curiosity is actually you know, what makes us human. And it took us, for better or for worse, it would say, to the top of the food chain. It's sort of what has enabled us to evolve and one hopes also to uh, become better. Now, we live in a culture that enshrines empathy as the greatest good. That is, you know, there's now an empathy workbook for children. <laughs> and if you go, if you go online uh, and try to find books about empathy, you'll find hundreds of them. And I think empathy, you know, is part of that's one of the features of the heroine. I mentioned care, uh, mm -hmm. but that kind of uh, I think care is more important than empathy. That is. When you're curious, you're attentive to something and you care for it. So actually, craft, curiosity, and care are all semantically linked. They all belong together. And I think we need to sort of move from a culture of empathy, where you know empathy is our cardinal virtue, to one that also values uh, curiosity and the way that it can it can put us on the path to something better. You know, I think this is fascinating because we are, as many people talk about, you know, we're at an interesting point in the civilization where we're beginning to rethink so many of our values and our behaviors because, you know, there's some imperatives with, with the climate and the planet that would maybe cause us to think that we need to, um, we've got some catching up to do culturally. And oh, yes, absolutely. And I always think of the fact that the planet, we we refer to Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. and, and there's something interesting about that gender divide. Uh, that is, you know, sometimes I think Mother Nature is taking her revenge on us is or is showing her fangs, at least. It's that, you know, I wonder it, it, in this care, creativity, and or craft, I think you call it, right. and curiosity, the three C's of the heroine. Um, I couldn't help but identify with the way you open the book and you tell the story of the graduate student showing up to Joseph Campbell's office. And she's, she's looking for a different kind of relationship to the myth. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's Campbell at Sarah Lawrence, and he was heroic. Everyone loved him. His classes were mobbed. He had to limit enrollments. He, himself, he was such a charming, erudite figure. And in marches this senior who says, uh, you know, I want to be the hero. I want, and and Campbell, Campbell's worried because he thinks, well, you get to give birth to the hero. You're the goal of the hero. Isn't that enough? And she says, no, it's not enough. I want to be the hero. And I think that, you know, she wasn't necessarily saying, I want to be the spiritual leader or I want to be the warrior, but I want to do something great and good. Uh, and, you know, heroines are always, I mean, for one thing, they have to worry about surviving. You know, they can't go on these journeys often, but they have to figure out a way to survive in a world that is very tough and also protect those around them, that is care for them. 
uh, make sure that they too survive, and then change the culture in which they live. And I think that undergraduate at Sarah Lawrence was really thinking hard about how can I make the world better? How can I change things? Uh, you know, it's around the time that Betty Friedan is telling us about the myth of the happy housewife. Mm. The myth in the negative sense of the term, that is uh, not a story that is foundational and powerful and helps us navigate reality, but a, a, a lie, really, uh, something that is not true. And I think she saw her destiny, you know, to living out this myth of the happy housewife and wanted to change that. So these values are um, not only is it a way to interpret these heroine stories, but I think you call for a, sort of an elevation of these values. In other words, the stories we've been told in mythology, these are the missing stories and they yeah. tend to belong to women. Do yes. I have that right? Absolutely. And there's a way in which, you know, we've, we've sort of idolized these natural born killers, Achilles, Hector, Hercules. Uh, they're all very good at uh, grabbing weapons and going into armed uh, combat. Then in ancient times also give us a, a whole, uh, well, I would say one heroine after another, but we've never really explored them. And it hasn't been until, say, Margaret Atwood gives us the Penelope Odd, where we suddenly uh, sort of look at the Odyssey in a completely different way and see that, you know, Penelope was heroic. She was crafty. Uh, she was clever and she did great things in order to serve. She also did some terrible things. Uh, Atwood does not whitewash anything. Uh, but we have Pat Barker uh, in the silence of the girls giving us the story of Briseis and how she survived. Or Circe, Madeline Miller's uh, blockbuster that, you know, what a fantastic novel that is suddenly Circe is no longer a witch but she's a healer she's somebody who creates beauty in the world and she has to encounter she encounters these terrible people who land on her island and want to pillage and uh, do terrible things and she is a, a wonderful counterforce and that we're finally getting these stories and to be sure, you know, it may not be the gospel truth in any sense of the term, but they ring true in powerful ways and they give us an alternative, uh, another way of looking at the world and thinking about what it means to do great good things. Well, it seems to me that that's your thesis, that we need more stories and more voices. We need a diversity um, because it, we've we've... Really, the the hero's story has been a, a warrior's story more than anything else, yeah. and yeah. you know, th there's a there's a breadth of human experience that isn't always the adventure of life isn't always played out on a battlefield. There are many other ways to create meaning, and I think that you yeah. know the other thing that you're talking about is really sort of the elevation of. Um, you know, the feminine powers and the feminine energy that has been, you know, it's it's obviously a missing piece. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think you're you're right that there there really should be many different models. And in the past, there's been a lot of gender trouble in our model for heroism. Uh, and there's a kind of strict bifurcation of, you know, the warrior, the male, the masculine warrior hero on the one hand, and then the woman at home spinning, sewing, uh, mending, healing, telling stories, telling stories, which often speak truth to power. And there's this kind of stark bifurcation that, I think is now sort of dissolving and disappearing where men can be heroines. They can take on the features that we've uh, normally attributed to women. And at the same time, and I worry a little bit about this, we've got a whole series of new warrior women uh, that is uh, these muscular brawny 
often hypersexualized women, as in Black Widow or Black Panther or uh, in that series, Killing Eve, uh, these female assassins who are, you know, who do these, uh, you know, incredible gymnastics and are, are, are the killer women in a, in a way. So, I mean, I like the fact that we can now have these crossovers, but I worry about the fact that we may be still so stuck with the male warrior killer model and um and and not looking at the many other possibilities like you can be a warrior and not necessarily be out to kill you may be out to rescue and save too well there's a among Jungians there is a a real fascination with the story of psyche um for obvious reasons right uh, the the latin psyche meaning you know, sort of the the interface between the soul and the mind, and um, so you know, uh, there there is a fair bit of conversation that psyche is really every woman. Her her trials are mm-hmm. every woman's trials that necessitate the process of individuation, which is really becoming a whole person, right? So um, it's. The, you know, Psyche's story is a is a story of initiation, it strikes me. And, and as I was reading your book, I thought to myself is, you know, you talk about initiation and, and, and being specific to a lot of heroin mm-hmm. stories. Why are we so fascinated with initiation? Oh, I think, you know, it's the whole idea of growing up and growing into yourself. And today we talk about self-actualization. That is, how do you get to be who you should be? Uh, how do you how do you get to the point where you do something that nobody else can do? <laughs> you know, something that makes you unique. So, uh, to me, there's nothing more important than that story about about uh, becoming becoming essentially the person that you want to be, and uh, and becoming. Well, as Nora Ephron puts it, become the hero of your own life, you know, uh, that is move away. Of course, you know, at times you are going to be a victim and there are going to be people who will be victims and we can't deny that fact. But how do you turn that around? How do you how do you move into the role of hero heroine and psyche? I mean, that story is it's not very long, but it is just packed with everything. Domestic drama, the rivalry with Venus, the rivalry with the sisters, marriage, marriage as a form, as loss, as a kind of death, and then falling in love and wanting intimacy, but then finding that your husband flees because you've looked at him and then going on you know, what's your, those tests, those tasks that Psyche has to carry out and succeeding in them, but also failing uh, and yet still finding a happily ever after. So it's an extraordinary story that, uh, and I think, you know, we don't have to just look at Apuleius's version of the story, but we're always making that story new. Uh, Jean Cocteau made it new in his story of Beauty and the Beast, uh, which is a variant of of Cupid and Psyche. So we're always, you know, trying to sort of come come to terms with all the issues that are raised by that tale. You also mentioned uh, in your book about Get Out, the movie Get Out, and how it is a modern retelling of the Bluebeard story, which is, um, wow, what a crazy story that is. You talk about that. Oh, well, Bluebeard was first written down at the end of the 17th century by a Frenchman named Charles Perrault. And it was framed as a story about women's curiosity. And and the moral, Perrault even attached a moral that says, women, don't be so curious. It's going to get you in trouble. Well, this woman makes the mistake of marrying a wealthy man And it's rumored, he's had many wives before, and it's rumored that he has done away with those those wives. But she's under the spell of this charismatic figure. She marries him, and 
what does Bluebeard do? He says, I'm going to give you this key, the keys to the house, and you can open any door you want. You can go anywhere you want, but don't go into the room uh, that you can open with this key. Don't open this door. And here's the key to it, by the way. Well, of course, you know, I said, every the minute you get this prohibition, you violate it in a fairy tale. It's like telling a kid, don't eat the, don't open this door to the candy store. Right. <laughs> Um, and um, and so what does she do? She crosses the threshold and she discovers on the walls the corpses of his previous wives. And uh, I won't go into all of the details, but, you know, she's actually very smart uh, because to disobey. That is, her curiosity is what rescues her because in the end, she manages to escape her husband, who is planning to behead her. And um, and she is rescued by her brothers in the end. But that's a story that exists in many different variations. Uh, sometimes she calls her little dog, and her dog is the one who who saves her. So you never know how, how the story is going to be retold and rejiggered. It's almost kaleidoscopic. Uh, but in, in Get Out, and I don't want to give too much away, we have a reversal of the roles where suddenly uh, Chris is in the role of Bluebeard's wife. Uh, and he is the one who is vulnerable. I mean, it's a story about what it is like to be Black in America. He is the one in, who is vulnerable. He is imperiled. And he has to figure out a way to get out, uh, to save himself, to rescue himself from, from evil, evil, pure and, and, and simple. And he has to use his wits and, and be the crafty one. And it seems also that this dis these discoveries, you know, beginning with the Bluebeard discovery and then all the iterations of that story, um, there's an awakening. So there's a loss of innocence, right? Oh, isn't this lovely? I'm just yeah. having dinner with my girlfriend's parents, right. or I'm just, I'm just newly, I'm the new bride, and I'm checking out the household. And there's a, uh, there's an awakening that you know, a loss of innocence. And this had me also very fascinated by your book because you talk about the hero's calling. And it's different for the heroine. You you talk about the epiphany, and that is something that Carl Jung was fascinated by. He he believed that epiphanies lead most likely to transcendence, and we actually are built for epiphanies. And you know, epiphanies have a very specific um, they're 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 uh, numinous. They they they're vivid. There's a sense that there's an otherworldly force at work. Yeah, right. And you you talk about this as this is the the calling for the heroine. I was struck by that. All right. And you know, if you think about epiphany, you know, originally it was used to describe a transcendent mo moment, a, a sort of re a religious uh, uh, experience. I always think of St. Teresa and her epiphany and uh, you know, it's kind of scary to see her so helpless, so, you know, giving in to this force. And I think there's a different kind of epiphany, that awakening, that moment of awakening where everything clicks and you realize, you realize, like Scheherazade, let's say, Scheherazade, who is under the threat of murder. Marriage is an institution haunted by the threat of murder. We get that again and again in fairy tales. Uh, she is, she has to figure out a way to save herself, to keep Shariar from decapitating her the next morning. And uh, I think, you know, in a sense, her, her understanding of the power of story, this moment in which she realized, I'm gonna tell him a story I'm going to stop it halfway through, arouses curiosity, and I'll save my neck for one more night. And by the way, I'm also going to use that storytelling to educate him. So, you know, it's this moment of, of crafting, of being supremely conscious, not just, you know, passive like St. Teresa and giving in to this other force, 
but also feeling connected with everything and realizing that the only way you're going to survive this is to be sharp and to do something that is spectacular that no one has ever done before and that will get you out of the worst possible imaginable situation. I, you're uh, calling up something as well about Cassandra. I want to shift gears with C- Cassandra's story because, again, there's a story where people often say uh, every woman is Cassandra in that she was given the gift to see, um, to see beyond, um, to see ahead, and yet no one would listen to her or believe her. Yes. So her, uh, yeah, ah. Oh. What What's your take on Cassandra? I remember growing up with Greek myths, you know, being under the spell of them. And Cassandra to me was this mad woman. You know, when I pictured her, her hair sort of flying in the wind, almost snake-like, almost a Medusa-like figure. And, and in fact, you know, when you, when you read about her, you see, I mean, she's always babbling and uh, saying these things that everyone thinks are totally absurd. Well, look at her. I mean, she is, she has the gift of prophecy. It's been given to her by Apollo, who takes it back because he sees her as a kind of tease. She won't give in to his sexual advances. So he curses her with a um, lack of credibility. Uh, and in fact, you know, she warns everyone about the Trojan. She warns them about Paris. Don't let Paris go to, you know, don't let him abduct Helen. Uh, she warns them about the Trojan horse. And there she is with ax in one hand and what is it, a torch in the other to try to destroy the Trojan horse. And she looks like a lunatic and everyone thinks she is. And, and, and then, I mean, if you think of her fate, the, the fact that she's taken back uh, by Ag- Agamemnon takes her home as his, his uh, concubine and, and she's uh, killed by Agamemnon's wife, yeah. <laughs> Clytemnestra. <laughs> uh, she's uh, killed by Clytemnestra. So she is the supreme victim. And uh, I think she becomes a kind of allegory of how women in our culture have been silenced, that they speak truth to power, but uh, no one wants to believe them. And and I think that's something that has really changed. Women's voices, I mean, look at the Me Too movement. Uh, women's voices are now being heard. People are paying attention. They're sitting up and listening when stories are told. And I think it's so significant that there's stories. Uh, we're not in the courtroom. We're in the court of public opinion, which has become a powerful force. Uh, no wonder the judiciary is upset about it, you know, because suddenly there's this alternative to the courtroom, which is often not paid attention to women's stories. You know, I think the Me Too, the hashtag Me Too movement was also really important because it wasn't one myth being told to many people. It was many people contributing to a storyline where after a while, the accumulation of it was undeniable. And I think participating in that moment, that cultural moment, I was also stunned at just the the plentitude of so many stories. And you could tell the way people were writing them, they were heartfelt, they were sincere, they had detail that made it very clear that this is what happened to me. And I just wonder how something like the internet, you know, you know, I'm going to ask you to kind of in the next couple of minutes, pull out your crystal ball. Mm -hmm. How is it changing the way we experience mythological stories and create new myths? Well, you know, in some ways, of course, uh, the Me Too movement gives us reality, the bite of reality. And uh, fairy tale and myth are in the realm of fiction. But I often think, you know, fairy tales, for example, I mean, myth, myth is sort of high culture, 
fairy tale we associate with the domestic we if, you know we see them as children's stories but in fact they were old wives tales and they were produced by a collective not it's not homer telling a story and and homer i mean we don't know was he sort of a collective but you know it's not a sing a bard or a rhapsode or a single storyteller but a woman in a spinning room who is telling her story to other women who is improvising and the story gets tweaked by the audience so in a way it's a collective production it's, it's one story but it's one story that then also exists in an infinite uh, variety uh, and infinite forms of variation. That is, uh, you know, there's not one Bluebeard story. You can find Bluebeard all over the world. You can find Little Red Riding Hood all over the world. You know, she may not always have a red hood, but it's a girl, a wolf, a monster in the woods, a beast in the wood, a predator in the, in the woods. So these stories are told all over the world. It's kind of a collective speaking. And uh, it is, it's not real, but I love the way that fairy tales begin in some cultures. It was, and it was not. So there is truth to this story that is fiction. There's more than a kernel of truth to it. So uh, now we have a new medium. Uh, and I worry about the fact that, you know, social media is kind of a, another form of unpaid labor, women telling their stories and who's capitalizing on it, but Google, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a great form of labor because it is a way of bringing us together. And, uh, you know, the downside is, of course, there will always be people who say, oh, these stories are made up. They can't all be true. But the force of the multitude, what you just, you know, it, you can't stop it. You can, it's, I, I think I, I, somebody uh, was once describing it as uh, a kind of prairie fire. Um, and it just, you know, there is no stopping it. It has a... a uh, an incredible power to it. And I think that we have to use that more. That is, you know, I'd like to see somebody start a hashtag me too uh, for abortion, for, um, uh, you know, women, women tell, and there's been some of that, but I think not enough. There has to be more momentum behind that. Yes, I'm waiting to see uh, what the reaction is going to be, because I, I agree with you. I think that the hashtag me too movement was a great projection of the fears that women have, that they will be like Cassandra. They will, they will be talking about their reality and no one will be listening to them. And I think you make that point about Cassandra that, you know, her, her true gift is that she sees the world for what it is. And then she's be able to make a prognostication based on that reality. And, and that that's a subtle, I mean, what you're really talking about is a high level of discernment, I guess. Oh, yes. And, and, you know, I often think of it in terms of, you know, what your mother tells you. Your mother is always right. Um, and for two weeks, I mean, partly because she's reading the signals but also there's something about ancestral wisdom. And, and I think, you know, the collective unconscious is part of that. Uh, Toni Morrison once wrote, listen to the ancestor, listen to those ancestral voices and, and pick, pick them up in the airwaves. And, uh, you know, there, there's something, there's something there that you have to pay attention to and bring into your own life. I think that that might explain why millennials and Gen Zs are so fascinated about their DNA and their, their purchasing tests, you know, 21 and Me, to, to really understand who, who, where they come from. That's right, that's right. Uh, and, and Henry Louis Gates Jr., mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, look at the, the the people that he's look at the expressions on the faces of the people he has interviewed. 
Um, and you see how important it is to them to understand their genealogy, where they come from, what their roots are, what their family tree looks like. Uh, it gets back to that idea, too, of self-actualization, understanding who you who your ancestors were and what you want to become. So looking backwards and then looking forward as well. So uh, both parts of that, I think, are really important. You know, you remind me of a I, I had a letter uh, written to me from an uncle um, who was living in the old country. My mother was an immigrant. And so all of her brothers and sisters, um, you know, were Ba still back in the old country. And uh, there was a line that was in his letter and I repeat it to my kids and, and, and um, they, they repeat it to others. And that was nobody belonging to us ever died in the poorhouse. meaning take the risk, be brave, you know, you're going to be fine. You know, that that's, that's what we do. And it's very, uh, bolstering to know that that's a lineage for our family yeah. to be brave. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are these uh, almost like folk wisdom, uh, family wisdom. Sometimes it takes the form of story. Sometimes it's just a, a phrase that is passed on from one generation to another. And, and it is a kind of, we were talking about epiphanies before, it is a kind of magical moment that is where you you feel connected with your past, but also you may be, you know, repeating that phrase or that story with others in your family. And it becomes a kind of bonding agent as well. I wonder, if, you know, you're, you spend your life, your career, Maria, looking at, you know, the past, stories from the past, fairy tales from the past, and yet when I was reading your book, I couldn't help but feel like the narrator had one foot in the past and, and one foot in the, in the future. And uh, you were looking, you know, the narrator's looking ahead to what the world might be like if we did have more and different stories and we had, we featured more heroines or we shone mm -hmm. the light on heroines that we do have and to reveal different sides of them. When you were writing about that, what was your vision? What, what could you as a kind of Cassandra see we might be able to achieve as a civilization if we had more diversities in our, diversity in our stories? Well, you're absolutely right. There's something nostalgic about the book. I mentioned that I'm sort of processing a lifetime of reading and teaching and, and also listening to my students. And I mean, I kind of feel that my students also co-wrote this book with me, but I'm also so deeply invested in making these stories new. That is, uh, you know, we we can't we can't sort of uh, stay with these stories from that they're not written in granite. Even the Bible, I, you know, we we think of it as a sacred text. I, I worry about that term sacred. I prefer irreverence. That is, you know, we have to sort of look at these older texts and older stories and discover what is relevant to us and then figure out ways to make it new. And yes, I am looking at the next generation and thinking about their creative spirit and, and what they can do. And, and particularly, you know, since so much is changing so rapidly in our world and, and many of these opportunities that my generation had, uh, you know, in the world of publishing in, in the world of journalism, uh, in the world of teaching even, are shrinking and collect, you know, these sort of creative opportunities. I mean, at the same time, we've had this sort of democratization of artistic production. So, so I guess, you know, I'm so curious to see how the next generation is going to navigate the waters, uh, how they're going to find opportunities to preserve these stories uh, pass them on to their own children and make them more interesting and more relevant. That's an exciting idea, Maria. And thank you for all your vision. Thank you for what is a beautifully researched and 
and talked about book. Um, I, I, we will make sure that we post a link to it. And I, I look forward to the world that you describe a world that has uh, heightened in interest in care and curiosity and craft. And, and I hope it does lead us to a more just world. I hope so. I hope that we continue to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. Thank you. Thanks, too.